Ghostbusters. Say it and 90% of the world knows what you're talking about. Say it to someone who was a little boy in 1984 when it first slammed into theaters and you get another side to the story. But unlike almost everything else in the 1980s that appealed to kids, Ghostbusters had little to no merchandising. There were some books, there was a Commodore 64 video game, there were some buttons and some t-shirts. And that's pretty much all she wrote. The movie ended with the Ghostbusters stowing their proton packs and driving away into the sunset. 1985 passed with no news of a sequel. Then, in 1986... <coughs> In 1986, Ghostbusters arrived on TV screens in the form of an animated series. But it wasn't that simple. Filmation, the animation studio behind Masters of the Universe, released a show called Ghostbusters. And it wasn't at all related to the 1984 film. It was actually based on a 1970s live-action television show called The Ghostbusters. Columbia Pictures licensed the name from Filmation in 1983 to use as the title of the Bill Murray film. Apparently, Columbia had also courted Filmation to make a cartoon adaptation of the movie, but at the last minute they gave the project to Deke. Filmation, not to be defeated, decided to make a cartoon adaptation of their live-action television show from the 70s instead. That's coming in a different video. Stay tuned. So in a sophomoric slap fight, Columbia called their cartoon The Real Ghostbusters. In truth, the real Ghostbusters would be the ones that came first, the ones in the 1970s TV show. One could argue the movie-based characters were the better Ghostbusters, but the Filmation Ghostbusters are just as real as the movie Ghostbusters. But let's get real about how we as kids felt. We didn't really care what Columbia ended up calling the show. We were just excited to see the movie Ghostbusters on TV. Finally, after two long years, we had more adventures with Vinkman, Ray, Egon, and Winston. On the one hand, it was awesome. On the other hand, it was a little disappointing. Admit it, the character designs are bizarre. For some reason, the likeness rights were not acquired, or allowed, or something. As a result, the Ghostbusters didn't look like the actors. Ray had orange hair. Winston didn't have his mustache. Venkman looked like a stylized John Cusack. Janine would have been more at home in a punk rock video on MTV. Then there was Egon. Poor Egon. Not only did they dress him in a blue and pink jumpsuit, they gave him red eyeglasses and this cannon barrel hairdo in a white blonde color. This wasn't Harold Ramis, it was Elton John. We wouldn't see the likes of this hairstyle abomination again until Ruby Rod in The Fifth Element. In the interest of giving the cartoon lots of color, all of their costumes were changed to make them even more distinguishable. I'll concede, though, that changing the characters' costumes and likenesses was a necessary evil. Had they kept them all in the tan jumpsuits, three out of four Ghostbusters would have been white dudes with dark hair and khaki suits. It would have been an animation nightmare, likely causing tons of continuity errors, and they would have been difficult to tell apart on screen. The proton packs, which were black in the film, were now mainly blue and yellow. The PKE meter was a massive gizmo in the cartoon, looking more like something in Doc Brown's toolbox in Back to the Future. Thankfully, despite the fact that there were numerous visual departures from the original film, the characters' personalities are largely faithful to the movie. Ray was exuberant. Yeah, isn't it terrific? Venkman was apathetic. Give me a break. Winston was hesitant. We've got to go after him. No, we don't. Show me where it says that. And Egon was no-nonsense. Can you read Samarian? In my sleep. 
actor Ernie Hudson auditioned to play Winston on the show and was inexplicably passed over for Arsenio Hall. But the strangest turnabout has to be Venkman. In the original ABC episodes of the show, he is voiced by Lorenzo Music. And you might notice he sounds identical to the animated Garfield of the period from Garfield and Friends. My heart can't take all the excitement. All right, who's the clown making that noise? Reportedly, Bill Murray didn't want Venkman to sound just like Garfield, and so music was replaced by David Coulier later in the show's run. However, in 2004, when they were casting the live-action Garfield film, Bill Murray was cast as the voice of Garfield. Now, allegedly, the reason this happened was because Bill Murray got confused and thought he was working with Joel Cohen, one of the famous Cohen brothers. But in reality, he was working with Joel Cohen, the writer of Garfield. Understandable mistake, but the irony's a little thick. Okay, now that that insane history's out of the way, how does the real Ghostbusters hold up as a TV show? Well, truth be told, it was probably the scariest cartoon on Saturday morning. There's no doubt, the writers on this show went to the wall, with a number of episodes easily as scary as the 1984 movie for a kid munching his cereal on Saturday. It's said that the original 13 episodes which aired on ABC are the best, and I would tend to agree they are some of the most memorable and well animated. To this day, the imagery is haunting. In the second episode, Mrs. Rogers' Neighborhood, the Ghostbusters investigate a haunted house at the request of an elderly woman, but she turns out to be this demonic entity that almost kills Janine at the firehouse. There's a famous episode called Citizen Ghost, which tells the story of the Ghostbusters' return from their battle with Gozer in the film, how they got their new uniforms, and how the ugly spud ghost, Slimer, came to live with them. For me, the scariest episode, hands down, is The Boogeyman Cometh, where children are terrorized at night by a cloven-hoofed devil that lives in another dimension and uses their closet doors to get into their rooms and prey on their fears. I still get freaked out when I think about this episode, and it's been 27 years since I first saw it. The writing on this show was often excellent, with veterans like Babylon 5 creator J. Michael Straczynski and Star Trek alumnus David Gerald penning episodes of the series. The show had a lot of heart, with some real suspense and genuine humor. Venkman got all the best lines, and the Ghostbusters were constantly in these epic races against time. The writers also made sure to give each character the limelight. In one, Winston is the last person left awake in New York City after the Sandman puts everyone to sleep. In another, Janine gets to go with them as a Ghostbuster because a genie granted her a wish of being the boss of the company. One personal gripe I have with the show is the first episode, Ghosts Are Us. I know they were trying to find their footing with the series, but the idea that the people of New York would be okay with ghosts running a ghost-catching business is too far-fetched even for Ghostbusters. After the first 13 episodes, the show moved to syndication for its second season and started out strong with Knock Knock, where subway workers stumble upon the gate to hell while digging a new tunnel. That's pretty hardcore for a cartoon by any standard. The show changed course upon entry into the third season, being retitled Slimer and the Real Ghostbusters. The goofy little ghost was pimped out like Urkel and given top billing to make the show more and more kid-friendly. To be fair, Slimer isn't the worst goofy kid-friendly character we've talked about on Retro Blasting. If you listed cartoon sidekicks from best to worst, Slimer would place ahead of T-Bob and Snarf, probably just behind Orko. I had stopped caring around the middle of the second season anyway and moved on to Captain Power. But the real Ghostbusters certainly didn't need me to be successful. The show lasted six years, and Slimer got his own high C juice box, Ecto Cooler. You know you've made it when you've got a high C flavor named after you. The show's lasting popularity likely prompted Columbia to jumpstart the big screen sequel, Ghostbusters 2, which landed in 1989 at the height of the real Ghostbusters run. Possibly a coincidence, but more likely by design, the studio tied the film visually to the cartoon in more than a few ways. Annie Potts' Janine suddenly looked like the animated character. Ernie Hudson's Winston coincidentally lost his mustache from the first film, making him look more like the animated Winston. The Ghostbusters were given different colored jumpsuits for some scenes, and the ghost that inspired Slimer was completely redesigned to look like the character from the cartoon. 
He's friendly in this film and even gives Lewis Tully a bus ride to save the city in time. You might be wondering why it took two years for Columbia Pictures to create a merchandising vehicle for Ghostbusters if it was so immensely popular in 1984. I think this boils down to the fact that in the early 1980s, Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, and Harold Ramis were not comedians for kids. Murray and Aykroyd were Saturday Night Live alums. Their films were comedies for adults, and movies like Blues Brothers, Stripes, Caddyshack, and Trading Places were not targeting a kid audience. I imagine Ghostbusters was seen much the same by the cast in the studio. I doubt they sought likeness rights or licensees for action figures and mass merchandising prior to release. No one could have predicted the broad appeal the film had when it landed. It appealed to adults and children alike, and is now a comedy classic. It was a Pixar-type triumph in 1984. As you might expect, the cartoon was accompanied by toys from Kenner, and the real Ghostbusters would be one of the most successful lines the company ever made. However, the toys came with some immense frustrations if you were a kid, and the line marked the beginning of a disturbing trend for Kenner action figures. Filmation, not to be defeated, decided to make a... Apparently, Columbia also courted Filmation to make a... I keep saying live action. Apparently, Columbia also courted Filmation to produce a live... <laughs> or licensees for action figures, or mass merchandising at the time. I don't remember what I'm going to say. 